Hello again, welcome back to the Convex2 panel 2021. I'm delighted to be with you here today to talk about the role of health design, technology, and innovation in the age of uh, pandemic and beyond. I have with me three distinguished guests, uh, longtime friends and colleagues. Um, I'm gonna start by asking them to briefly introduce themselves and then we'll start the panel. Nigel, would you like to start? Hello, I'm Nigel Edwards. I'm the Chief Executive of the Nuffield Trust, which is a foundation that does health services policy and research, and we have a particular interest in models of care and how those influence the built environment. Thanks, Nigel. Ty? Hi, Faro, Senior Partner, Faro Partners Architects, based in Toronto, working across Canada, coast to coast, uh, through Europe in the healthcare zone, uh, through to uh, Israel. Thank you, Ty. Bill? I'm Bill Hercules. I'm the CEO of WJH Health. I'm based in Orlando, Florida, but I work across the U.S. Uh, advising healthcare senior leaders around their future places of care uh, after practicing healthcare architecture for um, many, many decades. Bill, thank you. Um, I'm going to start with you. Um, you know, in 1933, Alvaro Alto designed the first tuberculosis design sanatorium when he built it, he, he's famed for saying that the role of the building is to become a medical instrument. So in light of this idea that architectural buildings can be a medical instrument, and given what we've learned from COVID, um, what's the key thing you're taking away from how the healthcare facilities perform during COVID? Well, I think that healthcare facilities were, were really pressed because they weren't designed for uh, such a pandemic. Uh, in fact, most uh, executive teams were really flat footed and they were trying to scramble to do the best they could. Uh, it was really sort of a fog of war kind of situation. Um, I think that there's a lot that, that has happened uh, over the last year and a half to inform things. And there are a number of uh, organizations that have um, developed model code language, for example, uh, to respond to future pandemics, um, but obviously um, those, those kinds of things that develop, nobody really understands when they're going to happen or what the nature of them is. So it, it really demands um, enormous flexibility of largely a fairly inflexible asset. You know, Ty, when you, when you look back to, you know, the plague and typhoid and polio and Florence Nightingale, there's massive technological innovations that have shaped healthcare after pandemics. What do you think will be the top technological changes uh, thus far based on how the facilities have performed again related to COVID and how will that shape and change the design community? I think technology is one thing. I think the one thing that's gonna shift everything we do is is we're gonna shift a little bit away from the machine of healthcare and hospitals. And we're gonna move back to beginning to focus on the individual and the human side. And so if you go back to Florence Nightingale and the, the famed hospital she did, what were the things that were based on? High ceilings for ventilation, large windows that were operable that they, they could swing open, courtyards that you could ambulate within, a little bench to sit on. I think what's happened is we've been involved so much in the machine and the science of care, what the pandemic has brought clearly, I think, uh, to the mind's eye is the human dimension. And, and if you just look at hospitals and the way that we, we are celebrating our, our nurses for the work that we're doing, but uh, the conditions that they work in uh, arguably are subhuman. So, so Nigel, if we're going to change the outcomes, we have to change the culture and behavior that produce them. So how are we going to go about that? I mean, do we need a new set of design principles? Yes, yes, undoubtedly. I think uh, both uh, Ty and Bill have, have put their finger on, uh, on several really important points that we've learned uh, during, during the pandemic. I mean, the, the, the first really important point is that um, uh, saving uh, a small amount of money on your construction costs at the price of flexibility, uh, 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 space for circulation, and in particular staff facilities, which in many countries have been stripped out the, the, the areas for doctors to rest in over when they're on call at night, for example, have often gone. Uh, we, we've stopped providing hot food. So the, the, um, there is an English expression which is called pound wise, uh, penny wise, pound foolish. 
Um, so we, we focus on the construction costs and not on the, the, the long term life cycle cost of these buildings. And the pandemic, I think, in many countries has laid bare that those those small savings that we've made, which have often been at the expense of patient and staff experience, uh, were a false economy. I want to add something into that, which I think really that tweaks my mind is, is the whole basis, as you know, that we say, OK, what we need to do is shorten the distance, for example, that a nurse walks. And because the, the tighter that can be, then she'll have more time, you know, he or she, to, to uh, work with patients or other things. But one wonders that if the walk is longer, instead of walking down a double loaded corridor, but walking along a single loaded corridor that has a view out to trees or nature or something else, which performance is better at the end of the day? And I think what we've done is we've focused on the human as a machine so that she as a machine goes a shorter distance. But what about the impact of the things that come in through here that adds the extra spring to his or her step? So Corbusier is rolling in his grave thinking how his principles are being implemented in healthcare. But if we think about this question of how we're measuring Bill, you know, do we have the right metrics to actually measure cytogenesis? That is to say, healthcare environments that actually induce wellness for the patient and family, as well as the staff in the milieu of hospitals and healthcare facilities? You know, I, I, I'm working with a, a group of researchers right now, and we're trying to define the amount of research that is uh, available for architects and uh, or authored by architects around architecture or our architectural space in the healthcare realm. And the Center for Health Design has a uh, repository of about 5,000 articles, most of which are not even peer reviewed. And if we compare that with the 30 million that are available to the medical professions in PubMed alone, um, it's not even a rounding error. So I think that the amount of research uh, is, is really has a, a long way to grow uh, in terms of cause and effect of specific interventions um, uh, around uh, design and their effects. I think there are a number of studies that are suggesting that a salutogenic approach is actually going to be helpful to Ty's point around uh, staff um, um, engagement, um, what, what they're dealing with, how they're de-stressing going from patient to patient uh, as opposed to working inside of a machine. So I think there's a, a rich field of, of research that still hasn't even been tapped yet. And nor does the profession really have the infrastructure to uh, conduct that research. So I think that there's a wide open space for that. So, you know, really, really important points, Bill. Um, I'm wondering, Nigel, given the learnings that we're finding around mental wellness, both of the staff, the patients, uh, us and our own uh, environments, what is the role of social scientists, behavioral scientists to human factors, engineers to help us redesign these healthcare facilities and reimagine the flow of healthcare? Yes, I think we returned, uh, we didn't fully pursue the question you asked about changing design principles because we just focused on one component of those, which are those related to staff and how they work. But actually, across the whole gamut of the way that we think about uh, the, the way that care is organised, the way that we fit into the buildings we're in, we're the prisoners of habit and ways of working. And, and uh, the principles of design, design, which aren't really design principles, they're, they're emergent things that, that don't necessarily represent really good practice. Uh, they're often based on workarounds, on uh, defending uh, uh, defending organisational boundaries or, or, unit, or boundaries of units so that people can manage their work. And so really getting a deep understanding of the, the sort of the sociology of the organisations that we're, we're planning for, I think, is, is something that we're, we're, we're really missing. And, and when we start to unpick that, we, we find that actually different professionals within our system think very differently about how the systems they're in actually work. And so, as of course, so did the patients and, and the people visiting. Um, but we're sort of designing for the standard person. You mentioned Le, Le Corbusier, um, you know, the, the, sort of the idea that as a sort of standard user, 
um, who's who, who sort of, um, I think you said, uh, Paul, in your notes to us, sort of late, uh, early middle aged white and male. Yes. Actually, this is not the start. I mean, the staff. I mean, one of the experiences we've had in the uh, in the UK, for example, is that the protective equipment that we've uh, got is designed for uh, is designed for men. Um, most of the people using it are women. But it's actually even when it's designed for women, it's designed for women from Western Europe. Quite a lot of our staff are from the Philippines. Um, it doesn't fit. So, and there's all sorts of these examples. I think where we've, you know, if you design for the average, it fits no one. We need a much better understanding of of how the systems work. And I think if we could, we ought to return to again. I think to this question of, you know, what are really challenging ourselves to look at what are the the implied design principles in what we do, and then really unpicking those and saying, well, what should these be if we if they're going to be fit for the future, uh, if they're going to uh, really support the way that people work, and also if they create architectures and, and, and environments which help people thrive, uh, that reduce the, the transmission of infection and, and generally support people behaving in the ways that we need them to, rather than having to send them policy documents or discipline them when they don't. Yeah, you know, Ty, you and I have talked uh, quite a bit about this issue of the, the unnoticed pandemic around healthcare workers. Um, hundreds of thousands of healthcare workers have been infected around the world. Um, tens of thousands have died, according to Amnesty International, including in the UK and Canada and the US. Um, there's a, a severe existential crisis around the physical and mental wellness of healthcare providers. So how does the design community um, more deeply think about the lived experience of those users, given you know, increasing numbers that people want to resign, leave early, and not wanting to both be at threat to themselves and potentially to their families, um, as well as the sense that the equipment in the facility was not designed to protect them and they were sacrificed on the altar of the system. So what's the challenge going forward as we think about protecting and supporting healthcare workers? Well, I think there's the one thing that we need to step back on where uh, often, I think as Nigel was saying, that we design things for people assuming that's what they need. And uh, certainly with the EDI, the equity, diversity, and inclusion, um, that as a topic is emerging in, in all areas that it's about don't do anything for me without me. And that relates to a whole variety of community. When we get into the design of hospitals, and we as architects or leadership or administrators are assuming this is what people need or what they believe is valuable um, is being done often without those people being included in the discussion. And so this idea of getting back to a co-creation process that is rich and frothy and has wide involvement in discussing what is important and how it should be designed clearly needs to be a cornerstone. And I think that ties together sort of that saludo systemic process, meaning that what are the things that actively cause health? Um, but the systemic thing is an individual's bodily, mentally, spiritual, individual health, their social health or the social health of the organization or societal and cultural health and tied back to ecological environmental health, those things are all tied together. And so really beginning to get back to the roots, you know, how do we define health? Back to, is it the, oh, well, it's, you know, it, there isn't the absence of disease, but if you go back to Aristotle, the concept of eudaimonia, human flourishing, you go back to, you know, ancient Chinese medicine, if you go through the Romans, if you go through, you know, native health, but you come up to disease, and, and discovering, uh, you know, Western evidence-based medicine in the late 1800s, the Fetner Report in 1910, said that if it's not Western evidence-based medicine, it's witchcraft. That means we wipe out about 5,000 years of thinking about a holistic idea of what causes health. So, you know, what's really interesting around that tie is and we think about health and we think about the implications for, for spatial design, one of the things I'm struck with is despite clinicians and healthcare teams working in hospitals, many of them are have very little awareness to the impact of space 
Um, and and uh, I'm curious, Bill, from your perspective, how do we help healthcare providers develop a respect for and an awareness to the impact of spatial decisions and how it influences their decisions about risk? For example, you know, uh, a paper came out this week suggesting that most of the healthcare providers infected in hospitals were not infected by patients. They were infected by peers in their call rooms, eating rooms, lounges, et cetera, or their lack of awareness of what was a high risk, medium risk, low risk zone. So how, as a design community, how do we signal, shape, and educate the providers in the process of engaging them around the design to help them understand the role and importance of of spatial design and the up and downstream effects of how that affects their workflow and their overall ability to achieve um, the delivery of healthcare? You're muted, Bill. Bill, you're muted. That's just an enormous question. <laughs> um, so um, it's it, let me address let me address it in a in a fairly simple and direct way. It's it's sort of a how to question. But um, some of the uh, discussions that you were having around uh, um, how how staff had become infected is sort of reminiscent of uh, what happened with Florence Nightingale's uh, rose diagram around how patients were actually dying. It wasn't from the war wounds, but it was but it was because of environmental factors or cross contamination or or um, uh, other. Uh, staff processes. So I, I think that there's a, uh, a fundamental education around what the space actually is and what it's not. Um, and some, uh, I've got a couple colleagues and, and I are, are actually putting together a, um, a, a, a thesis and have published it a few times uh, around the idea that, that um, healthcare architecture is actually uh, a therapeutic intervention. It needs to be considered as such uh, with high stakes consequences around what what actually what the outcomes really are going to be. Uh, And not just in a theoretical model, but if we're going to be doing um, um, uh, human subject research, we we need to get institutional review boards involved and a variety of other um, um, controlling kinds of uh, uh, mechanisms to really understand what that is. So that's sort of a tangent to to your question. So the the how to is really kind of an immersive uh, uh, engagement with as many people that are going to be using the space in a variety of roles that need to happen. First of all, um, the staff and the caregivers, but to uh, to Ty's point um, a few questions ago around um, engaging a number of the people that are going to be involved in the in the project not just um, in the design or a daily operation but episodic uh, use of it as a patient or as a family member or as a parent of a, a child that's going to be there those groups and that that feedback uh, is extremely valuable but uh, let me also digress uh, for a second um, and suggest that um, uh, 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 Johann Gotha had defined architecture as frozen music. Uh, The decisions that are made today are for today. They may be projected into the future, but nobody really understands what what that future is going to be. So that's a very tricky play as we're considering what um, hospitals effectively are going to be or across their 40 or 50 or 60 year lives. So uh, it's a very uh, fluid kind of thing. You know, what's interesting about the frozen of the future is it really brings into the political question. And Nigel, this is for you. You know, there's a lot of evidence, both in the UK and the US and Canada, um, that the COVID-19 has greatly damaged the trust of the public in government institutions and agencies, WHO, FDA, CDC, OSHA. How do you think this is going to affect uh, future um, decisions as it relates to the built environment and the willingness of the public to follow, support, and engage, um, given um, the incredible breach in what the public perceives as truthful information and and the conflicting, often conflicting opinions that has really created uh, an echo chamber of noise and fake news? So what's the messaging that you put forward to build on that? Well, that's a simple question, Paul. Thanks for, thank you for uh, throwing that one at me. Um, uh, I think um, when I look at the pandemic generally, uh, I, I, in a whole number of spheres, 
I think we should regard it as an accelerator, not a, not a huge change in direction. I mean, there's lots of evidence that uh, across, particularly uh, the West, West, that the, the confidence in experts, uh, general faith in elements of our democratic system, uh, have been in decline for quite a long time. Um, uh, and elements of the COVID crisis, combined with uh, some of the political leadership in some countries, has has tended to accelerate that problem. Um, uh, but you know what? Um, it's still the case that generally people trust their, the health professionals they deal with. They may, dis they may even trust the politicians they deal with on a personal basis. They, they tend to distrust the experts in general, but have a quite a good regard for the experts that they know. Um, so that's a, a little a gleam, gleam of hope here. And if we adopt the sort of highly immersive and, and engaging approaches to co-production that both Ty and Bill have, have re referred to, then some of that mistrust can be overcome by the, the development of personal relationships between the experts and the, uh, and, and, and the people working on, the, on, on, a, on a local development scheme. Um, so I, I, we should probably not worry uh, quite so much. What we do need to uh, acknowledge, though, that there is a general um, uh, thing which is just saying to them, look, this is the expert view and you have to like it, uh, is no longer good enough. We do have to explain ourselves. We have to present the evidence. We have to walk people through it carefully. We often have to, we may have to explain quite complex statistical or, or evidential concepts to help them understand it. We can't just go, look, it's okay. Trust me on this. It will be, it will be fine. But I think for the, for the individual experts working in local contexts, dealing with real people, as opposed to people who work at a national, I think, People who work at a national and supranational level have got a real problem because um, very few people trust them, and they can't. You know, in in the case of my country, they can't engage sixty five million people uh, on that personal level. All we see them is mediated through uh, social media, the, the media, and in general, people are, frankly, in the case of our, our current government, rightly sceptical that they're being told the truth. Um, but that's that's a different thing. I think the personal expertise based on uh, you know trust and personal relationships is still really important, and that really means that we need to pay attention to the sort of co-creation, co-production processes that we engage with when we start talking to people about how we're going to change our local services, and we do it as early as we possibly can, and we're as honest as we can be, and it, and we don't. Everyone's very fright, worried about frightening people, but you know, actually, it's better to be honest. I think, even if if what you're saying to them may be initially alarming, because they will make up even worse things than you're possibly you know, uh, about what you might be doing uh, if you aren't fully open. They will catastrophize, and we can help them prevent help prevent that. I think so. I'd be a bit more optimistic for those of us who are in the sort of practitioner space rather than in the policy national policy space. But they they've got a big problem. But it's not for today, or for us. Thank goodness. One of our. I'd like to uh, uh, actually add to that, if I can. Um, I think w what politicians have ignored is is basic human nature in in uh, their proclamations and uh, um, uh, communications around the fog of war of what the pandemic has been, and even in the best of times, um, adoption really does follow something more like more curve where there are early adopters and then you know the general populace and laggards etc so that's in in the best of times when we try to compress that into uh an emergent condition like a pandemic uh we're expecting people to to act uh only chaos will ensue and i think the politicians have largely ignored that if you look at Germany and New Zealand, I think we see two very good examples of, 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 sort of grown up politicians, you know, prepared to say you know, things that may not be very palatable to their population and be prepared to also admit where we don't know things. Um, and, and, and in particular, in those, in the two, those two cases, un, unlike um, uh, uh, the, the UK, and, uh, well, the England at least, um, and, the, and the US until recently, not, the, without, without an underlying ideological underpinning about how you're making the decision. So, that, um, so I, I think, and actually in the space we're in here talking about buildings and, and the role of hospitals, so we're, we're, not, we're, we're, we're in the fortunate position of, of we're coming to this with less ideological baggage and we can be more like uh, Angela Merkel uh, than, uh, um, than, than some of the others. Uh, we can just lay it out and say, 
you know, there's some tough choices, there's some difficult decisions, there are some real uncertainties that we don't understand, and I, I'm not going to pretend to you that we do, um, and let us work through with you how we might uh, prepare for what happens if, if these come to, to so there is some there is some lessons from politics positive lessons to take from politics just unfortunately not from those in my country nigel's i think nigel's point when you when you take that to the design process where where you're getting together with a, a group of staff about designing something and and somebody asks you well what should we be doing or what's the direction and and the idea that the professional might not know but here are some variations or uh, areas that we can explore together to try and determine what a good outcome is, as opposed to, well, you're the outcome, you're the one that should be telling me, well, that's not true. So you've all spoken to this issue directly and indirectly. Um, the idea of democratizing the design process, which is mostly in opposition to the ideal Bauhaus idea of an idealized solution for everybody, wherever they are, uh, irrespective of their taste, how do we, in a financially driven market space, how do we incentivize and support meaningful co-production and co-design throughout the process of uh, procurement, you know, um, schematic designs, ultimate physical construction bill? How do we actually fund and support the architect's time, the designer's community time to meaningfully do co-design from the beginning throughout the entire project in order to instill the trust in the staff and the patient community that has to use those facilities. If any architect has um, ever designed a house for a couple, they understand how intimate that process is. And typically there are tears, even in the best of outcomes, there are tears. If we magnify that to something as complex as a healthcare institution or an academic medical center, uh, ultimately it comes down to um, developing trust as a foundation, and that was discussed uh, in the previous question. I think that's the first element of, of any engagement is establishing fundamental trust. I mean, you had mentioned uh, uh, the Bauhaus, um, which is an interesting idea, but it, it was born out of a time. Uh, it was born in a time right after um, the, the, the First World War. Uh, Germany's economy was, was decimated uh, as a result of the war. And there was a frugality and an honesty about materials that um, was became sort of the, the ethos of the day. Um, it, and if we contrast that with what was going on in other parts of, of Europe or even the United States um, with kind of a revival of the Beaux-Arts period, um, those were in, in, in contrast. In, fr in fact, Frank Lloyd Wright um, uh, had a, a famous saying around, um, less is not more, as Mies van der Hoek had said, but less is a bore. I mean, there were clear uh, uh, ideological differences in what the architecture is about here. Uh, but fundamentally, it's about engendering trust and where are we going here and who is the we that we're trying to solve for? Is it the group of stakeholders that are around a conference table or is it a much larger group? And to the point earlier, I would argue you've got to be thinking about th this generationally too, well beyond uh, the current leadership of any organization. Um, Ty, you wanted to respond to that too. Well, I think you were leading, as I was reading it, that is it more expensive for architects to do a co-creation process? And so do they need more money to do this? I would argue uh, the exact opposite, that their fees are fine to do a co-creation process compared to a regular process. Why do I say that? You have to go into a design process with an abundance mentality. And what I mean is, back to Bill's idea of building trust, is if you go with in a group of people and you, you say, okay, what is every variation we can look at on laying out this department, this hospital, or this master plan? And if you lay out all of the variations and then come back again with the group and talk about what works and what doesn't, what you will do with that group is you'll pair those down and pair them down and pair them down and some will come together until you get the preferred direction. What that does is instead of doing the scheme and then defending it, and then it gets somewhere along the way and somebody says, well, why didn't you do the other variation? And then you retreat and have to draw that up again. 
we find you never go backwards because everybody knows exactly why we're going in that direction because we compared, contrast, and we tried the other models or variations. And it has to be done in the context of instead of silos, all things considered within function, within budget, within sustainability, with, within a time and all the rest. And that's when you will get a robust solution that is effective and will begin to live through the test of time. You know, since this is a technology forum, uh, I think we also need to touch on technology's effects in all of this. Uh, as Ty was describing, a very human process. Um, but uh, software developers for the last 10 or 15 years have been developing various algorithms uh, around uh, uh, collections of parameters. And some of the parameters can get very defined and refined. So, and out of that will come literally thousands of variations of, of ideas. So it's not just a question of let's sit down and try to develop the perfect mousetrap, so to speak, but there is no shortage of variations based on those parameters. And those are developed digitally, um, in, sometimes with artificial intelligent algorithms. Um, but at the end of the day, as Ty was saying, it does need to resolve to some human interaction. It's sort of like digital music is, is uh, or modern music right now is produced on a, on a laptop or on a phone. Um, whereas before we used to blow into tubes or strum things or hit things. And we used to make music that way. At some point, it still has to resolve to an analog signal that your ears will appreciate. And I think that we've sort of lost that gap. Yeah, and so, I think Paul and I, we've had a discussion around that in the sense that we know all the knowledge about hand washing and, and all the infection control things but people don't do it unless they're either washed or, or otherwise. So, you know, you, you can lay out all of the variations and this is the best way to do it, but we're human, human beings. And if, if, we, if it doesn't get picked up in that dimension, it doesn't work. Absolutely. And Nigel, I was going to, um, one of the things you and I have talked about over the years is this question of, you know, we can, um, we can design technologies like telemedicine, telehealth, and they're very important. And COVID has dramatically up, upended the, the, uh, the system, the ecosystem. What's really intriguing in the first few months after the COVID pandemic is that there was a massive increase in telemedicine interest. What's happening in the last several months being reported, particularly in the UK and the US, is that while patients want more telehealth, clinicians want less of it. What do you think that bodes for the future of telemedicine, telehealth, and, and what's the signal to the ecosystem of technology developers as to the dispersion of signal between the consumer who wants more of it, but the providers who are realizing they actually want more brick and mortar, and how does that influence the design community that are struggling? Do we need more spaces, less spaces? What's the signal, the correct signal ratio? Well, well, well interestingly, in the, in, in the UK, the consumers want more face-to-face -face in primary care uh, and, the, and the providers want more phone. Um, actually, very few people are using video. Um, unless you've got movement disorders, or, um, uh, quite a lot of photographs are good, are good for rashes and, le and lesions. And um, uh, video, you need video perhaps if you're doing uh, a, a psychological assessment or looking at movement disorders. But mostly the phone, you know, 120 year old technology is, is fine. So just, just be, be careful about the enthusiasm for, for tech here. That, 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 you know, that, that the asynchronous um, uh, photograph and, and, and data or telephone, it probably trumps video on most of these things. Um, on the, on, in, the second, in, se in the secondary care space, I think, there's, there's, I think it's hard for us to generalize in, in the UK setting. Um, there, isn't, there isn't necessarily a push from providers for more face to face. Partly, it, this may be because the UK has moved away from fee-for-service payment for outpatient consultation. And I suspect that what you're really picking up there, Paul, is not a view about the technology, but a view about the reimbursement model. Um, and I think, you know, there's, the, the health systems around the world have been very bad at, you know, the, 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 the reimbursement models lag clinical practice and patient preference considerably, generally. Um, and I, I, there's a bit of a need for the, the reimbursement to pick up to, to catch up if we're interested in population health 
we don't really want our specialists to deal with not in, with non communicable diseases billing by the minute um uh, and being and getting more money for face to face than, than 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 digital we want them to be paid for adding value and doing the right thing so i think this is not a technology problem this is a reimbursement and behavior problem and and i, I just just one sort of slight aside on this is that you know that actually um uh, I've seen some fantastic clinics for glaucoma where the, the, the ophthalmologist basically looks at data and, and scans and reads the history and doesn't talk to a patient. Now, some people who go into ophthalmology might appreciate that, but most people who went to medicine did actually go into it in the hope they might end up talking to people. So we, the, the other, the, the sort of the human side of what does it mean to be a doctor? And, and it probably didn't mean uh, feeling that you're a high tech, high paid call center worker um that you know that you're, you're doing medicine not selling people cable tv so i think we just need to have a little bit think about the design of people's jobs and how they operate but i think this is to, this is all behavioral and, and incentives and uh, not about the technology um uh, uh, per se i think you know that I, I suspect we will settle down to a substantial number of consultations continuing to be done by by telephone and increasing amounts of, of stuff done asynchronously but it we need to just keep an eye on what that means for the uh, the, the, the work life uh, and, and you know the the joy and work problem that we're suffering in quite a lot of areas of medicine at, at the moment in terms of the physical facilities it does probably mean fewer consulting rooms and those consulting rooms we have are bigger more multi-purpose they can stay allow you to do multidisciplinary consultation um they, they may have that they'll be they'll be designed to do procedures because most of the sitting and listening bit may well now be done through different modalities yeah so pivoting out to construction uh, um techniques bill you know we've seen this emergent architecture or emergency architecture with field hospitals and and ships and tents and field units um, did it work, first of all? So in your vantage point around the world, did these facilities work in to deliver the care safely well, number one? And how will that influence future designers thinking about techniques, rapid upscaling, and change the dimensions of uh, future remodeling and design of new facilities? Well, uh, at, at the outset of the pandemic um, in the U.S., the Corps of Engineers uh, was famously waving their playbook, which consisted of about four pages of notes that, it, from my opinion, looked like somebody uh, had binge watched uh, a, a doctor's show uh, while cooped up and wrote about that. It was, it was a very um, sophomoric approach to what health facilities were. And I thought, oh my God, we've really turned the clock back 150 years to Florence Nightingale days because we're gonna have open wards is the pandemic really that bad that we have to really suspend what we have learned over the last 150 years um, to, uh, to a more primitive model? Eventually that playbook was developed, um, but uh, to the question of, well, were they, were they even really used? I think famously most were not. Uh, in fact, many of them that were built in convention centers, et cetera, saw zero patients. So uh, I guess that was a, a question of not just the facilities themselves, but who was going to operate them, um, how, who was going to take custody of these, of these patients who were likely going to die anyway. Um, healthcare administrators didn't want that record on their books. Um, uh, how was all this going to be funded? Uh, there were a lot of major questions from an administrative standpoint that I think uh, called into question what was going on. Nonetheless, the Corps of Engineers, being the national program managers, did their dutiful uh, role and created literally thousands of these across the U.S. Uh, so going forward, uh, the, the group in the U.S. that crafts the model code, the Facility Guidelines Institute, um, which is a, uh, an organization that uh, crafts the code that is ultimately used by most states in the development of their hospital codes, 
uh, had convened a panel to really study the idea around surge capacity. But it wasn't just um, surge capacity related to a pandemic, it was also uh, related to mass shootings or uh, uh, weather events, hurricanes, tornadoes, earthquakes, et cetera, um, or any other reason that a hospital would just be suddenly inundated with patients and they would have to be treating them uh, in the parking lot out, outside of the ED. And what started out as a white paper ultimately became a 700 page tome of recommendations. Um, and I was happened to be part of the team that, that developed that. But the, the hard thing is, while that advice is now out there in the public domain, it's unlikely that it will be um, in, uh, put into practice uh, for another um, eight to 10 years. And I say that because of the cycles associated with adoption of, of those ideas into the code, which is prescriptive. And then the design processes that follow that code, uh, ultimately manifesting themselves in um, cons uh, responsive construction. Nigel, did you want to respond to that as well? Um, yeah, the question was about um, field hospitals, wasn't it? Uh, yeah, so yeah, um, architecture to create. Yeah. So, um, so uh, the use of, as Bill says, the use of convention centres uh, failed largely because they they had no staff, um, uh, and and the idea was that hospitals would send staff to them. Secondly, they were built before we really understood the disease. Um, so it's a multi-system disease, um, and, and we, we were building ventilated bays, and it turned out that ventilating people was a bad idea quite often. Um, so, uh, the, Scandinavia had some successful examples of, of plug-in hospitals that you can put in the car park uh, with, or, or in, in Israel in the uh, in the basement, um, which plugs into existing services, and the staff you can use the staff, um, and and you can keep responsibility for the for, for the patients within a single building, even if it spills out onto the car park. Those seem to those seem to work quite well. I mean, I think one of the issues here was you need to understand the disease before you start building stuff. I mean, that, that's 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 less less than one. Lesson two, which Bill sort of referred to, is all generals prepared to fight the next war using the strategies of the last. So we need to be that seven hundred page pay book is going to come back and bite you, I bet, with, because we'll have something else, um, and it won't fit the norovirus. It will it'll be more like norovirus than than, um, than than COVID, or it'll be more like you know it'll be it'll be more airborne, or it will be um, it, it will be more infected infectious. So we just need to be really 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 quick at understanding uh, the, the disease process before we start doing this and i th but i think that the, the key learning here is if you can't staff it don't build it it's not the field of dreams you know um if you build it the staff the patients may come but the patient the, 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 but the staff may not and then you've uh, you've really got a problem okay. um Ty, you know, we're talking about hospitals here, but obviously what the pandemic is, is really focusing on is urbanism, the way we live, the way we socialize, the way we get locked down, the environments. What do you think are the major architecture implications, the lessons for rethinking the urban fabric uh, as it relates to it creating more wellness, less sickness? And what are things that COVID has accelerated and offer us an opportunity to re-innovate and rethink some basic assumptions, particularly with older cities that are sort of locked into an infrastructure? So what are key things that come to mind that we need to be uh, exploring as we envision a, a more wellness in these settings around the healthcare facilities in the fabric of life that people live within? I, I think part of it comes back to, again, just defining what health is. And I think we're, we're very focused on ecological health, uh, which clearly is significantly, it's, there's a great importance of, of all aspects, but I think it's back to the idea of planetary health, you know, the Lancet Commission and the Rockefeller Center, you know, defining which, you know, was, was exceptional, but just that all of these things are intertwined together. And so there's ecological health. I mean, design has a significant impact on ecological health. Design has a significant effect on physical health, the way we design suburbs and, and we zoned and we created these things. Design has a significant effect on social or societal health, which clearly COVID brought to, brought to the, the forefront. I mean, if, if you look at the, the, the Black Lives Matter movement, I mean, people were feeling um, vulnerable already. And then when we saw somebody who was an authority who did something uh, 
uh, quite significant, um, we all felt vulnerable and that sort of tied it together. We've designed cities to separate people specifically, you know, as, as, a, as a profession. Um, and then the other piece is, is mind health. And again, uh, how do environments make us feel and how can they make us feel better? And I think it's, it's tied back to, you know, habitat design has a significant relationship to process design. You know, salutogenesis has a significant relationship to systemic process. Um, I, I think the key piece of, of cities and buildings is we have designed things in a very absolute way and usually in a singular way. And, and we've, we've tried to cut out as many variables as possible. And in fact, I think if, uh, as you know, I just finished a degree in Master of Neuroscience Applied to Architecture. And the interesting thing with the scientists and the neuroscientists and, and the other, some of them that we dealt with, science, its job is to take the variables out of it. Design is the exact opposite. And city design is the exact opposite. There's more and more and more variables. And when we look at the people and the communities and where they're coming, as we were talking earlier, there's more and more variables on what makes me feel good or might, what makes me feel better compared to past or cultural or, or experience aspects. And so I think, again, back to the idea of moving away from the silos and beginning to pull in as many variables uh, as possible. And, and um, also the buildings, either from education buildings or hospital buildings that have become redundant is there is no flexibility in them it's all been carved out in, in every aspect to allow anything else to happen besides what was conceived at that period, period of time. And as you well know, hospitals have to be the one building type that the buildings from the, the 80s have been torn down because they're redundant. You know, the ones from the 90s, they don't work anymore. And the old, old buildings that have high ceilings and, and a bigger grid and, and are more adaptable and flexible. They're the ones that seem to survive and are used for a whole variety of things. That's the same with cities and it's the same with, with building types or hospitals. So Bill, do you think we can design hospitals or cities that actually reduce infections? Is it actually possible, uh, practical, to rethink the flow of infection control? That is to say, it's not just this space, but as the awareness of infection control has dramatically increased in the last two years, how do we use this moment to think about infection prevention and control and how it influences the whole continuum from the codes to the design, to the implementation, the reimbursement? So what does this tell us about the future of infection control in a more meaningful and practical way? You know, when COVID started and we didn't, uh, we didn't really know where things were going and we were advising a whole variety of different groups from the healthcare sector or or the education sector on, on what are some of the principles we should use moving forward. We went through SARS and we certainly uh, you know, understood, certainly Toronto did in, in, in a big way. But at the very beginning, I started saying we should be designing these environments, either neighborhoods or buildings like submarines. How do submarines work? If you get a breach somewhere, what can you do? You can yeah. close off a, a part and clearly that's, become the basis of, of how we're beginning to look at it. If you look at neighborhoods, you know, if neighborhoods are multi-use and have all the uses within them, then people can operate within, within an area if, if sort of the boundaries are, are somewhat closed, but at other times they can be like a flower that opens up and, 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 or can close down at night. And I think if, if, we, if we begin to look at, um, things in that light will do very well. If you look at city design, you know, the whole 15 minute city, that's a very old, old idea, right? That where you work, where you live, where you play, where you go to school, where you visit your doctor, you know, they're all in, in a reasonable proximity. We sort of push that aside, that's coming back again. It's very pragmatic and simple. All of it, that ties back equally to supply chain stuff because you have the stuff you know, within the areas that has reasonable control. 
Bill, did you want to? Well, it, there was at the beginning of the pandemic, um, there were a couple design firms that began studying the density of cities and thinking places like New York or Manhattan, for example, highly dense cities um, um, were really the cause of the, the spread of, of the pandemic like wildfire. Uh, what the studies really ultimately concluded was not really. Um, and the um, and it was very interesting. It was almost antithetical. But if we turn the clock back to um, the early 20th century, uh, in the age of industrial uh, uh, the industrial revolution, where cities were really the centers of populations and uh, people were literally stacked one on top of another. Um, disease was rampant and uh, 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 sanitary systems were virtually non-existent up to that point and then became a derivative of that. Um, and then quickly um, after the, uh, uh, the, the pandemic of that time subsided, behaviors sort of reverted back to, okay, everything's fine. So uh, uh, the population has a relatively short memory around these things. And my concern isn't that we would design it in such a way that would create the mechanisms to reduce infection control, but more simply that they would actually be used. You know, to, to Nigel's point before about the worst offenders of um, uh, hand washing are physicians who should know better. <laughs> you think, yes. So I want to pivot now. Um, before the pandemic, there was a there was a an epidemic of isolation and loneliness amongst the elderly, and there's a feeling around the world that we more or less abandon our elderly in the UK, in the US, in Sweden, um, and particularly as it relates to wellness and and dealing with chronic illness amongst the elderly. How did this come about, and what are some key lessons from a public policy perspective on how do we address the question of the elderly as we're all aging? Um, and what are the implications for design, for technology, and for future solutions around the space of the elderly wellness? Another small question of limited scope, Paul. Thanks for that. Um, uh, the, where to start with that? Um, and one one of the issues is um, the, the 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 housing stock replacement in many developed countries is is is, is very slow. I mean, I, I don't know what the figure is, but you know, we, we've still got a very substantial number of people living in houses constructed in the 1800s, um, which were not constructed for people who were going to get to be 80 uh, with limited mobility, um, and we're just not replacing that stuff um, or building alternative uh, housing, which is easy to age in place in. Um, so I think there's a sort of big public policy. And unfortunately, of course, many public authorities in many countries now stop building housing at all. Um, and the, the economic model uh, for the private sector in these countries, of course, appeals to people who are already likely to be quite well, well into their uh, in, into their 70s and 80s, whereas actually the, many of the problems that we've got in many of our communities, particularly ones that uh, the bill is referring to there, people are having the diseases of ageing in their 50s. Um, and they're going to be stuck in housing that's not that's not not appropriate in communities, as you say, that leads on to a second problem, which is problem of isolation. So I think there is a sort of um, a need to really rethink the communities and housing that people live in. But you know, I think there's a, just a slight concern here that uh, yeah, healthcare has got enough to do to sort out its own problems. Uh, we can't. We healthcare cannot solve the problems of the rest of society. You know, many of the issues to do with, uh, you know, very high mortality rates in density population is not just dense population. It's income inequality. It's diseases of poverty. It's de it's deaths of, by despair. You know, these are things which are out of our reach. There are things that architects and and and, and planners can do to to help with that and to ameliorate some of the worst effects of it, but. Um, you know, I, I think you should be very careful about assuming um, uh, more responsibility for fixing problems in these areas um, uh, than, than, is, than it's reasonable to, to expect. Um, uh, we need to uh, probably get some architects to try and fix our broken political systems, <laughs> which are clearly as unfit for pur purpose of running complex modern states in many countries as our housing stock is for the people who live in it. <laughs>
Hi, you and I have talked a lot about, um, you know, the ITU, the ICUs, intensive care, and I've spent 20 years and I've always thought that they're poorly designed for purpose. COVID has given us an opportunity to rethink the flow, the infection control. What are some of your thoughts about what types of lessons are the design community going to take as far as the future design of critical care spaces, the amount that we need, as well as the infrastructure, the agility of the spaces, and how will that shape the future of, uh, of hospitals and, and, uh, and critical care management? As we talked not that long ago, I think the, the one piece and specifically coming out of COVID, again, is back to the human dimension. Um, I think a lot of the ICUs that you move through are, are quite chaotic, uh, the qualitative aspects to do your job on a daily basis. Uh, if, if from a staff standpoint, um, are suboptimal. And, I, and I, I think, in fact, I was just reading something again about the number of the highly skilled uh, nursing staff or professional staff that are so it was Canadian staff that were leaving the profession uh, because of the straight burnout. I think again the question is what if you if you look at through a lens of mind health and what is the environment doing to support you to do your best job and that's beyond just the the straight functional aspects but all the also the human aspects. Um, that can support um, uh, allowing you to, to do your best. Yeah, um, so Bill, you and I for many years have talked about our joint interest in training and education, both of healthcare providers learning about design, but more importantly, but how do we train the architects and designers of the future? COVID has completely upended the traditional education and training. Um, and I'm wondering in your thoughts, what is the role of COVID in giving us a, a, a needed push to rethink, are we designing architects and designers of the future in the best way in order to be able to have the impact on safety and quality and human factors in a way that we can apply the lessons from COVID? And wh where does new technologies come into place in that new curriculum? You know, the, the curriculum of architecture schools has been widely debated for probably as long as the profession has been around. Um, and I'm actually on the, an advisory board for a university school of architecture uh, for the University of Florida. And one of the things that we, we keep talking about are the, is the, uh, um, uh, the, the pedagogy associated with the architecture school itself and what they're actually learning um, um, about design and then uh, design of systems, design of objects, uh, design of, of how people interact, et cetera. Um, and uh, quite frankly, I, I think everybody agrees that it's woefully inadequate and it's not likely to improve. Um, I think one of the things that really should happen is, is uh, an extension of an internship to really do a deeper dive into this once uh, people really understand um, what's, uh, what the profession is really all about um, in, in sort of a practicum. And um, uh, it's, it's, it's a very imperfect model, uh, and I don't see it um, really fixing itself anytime into the future. So I want to, uh, you guys have been wonderful and thoughtful. I want to do a final round and ask each of you some final thoughts. You know, given what we've learned in the last several years, um, what are your wireless ideas for hospitals or healthcare systems of the future in order to create more wellness? And so I'll start with you, Nigel, and then Ty, and then end with you, Bill. Nigel? Well, I think it's back to this. We need to really go back and fundamentally look at some of the assumptions that we make about when we when we start to design about the, the way that care is organised, the way that staff work, the way that uh, patients experience the system, and the way that the hospitals fit into the environment in which they uh, in, in which they sit. And we, we need to take all of those apart, examine them, and see whether or not they're right. And what we'll find is that many of them aren't very evidence based. They may have been true once; they're probably not true now. Um, and that they don't, they, they, because you know, the, the famous dictum in, in, in healthcare quality is that every system is perfectly designed to achieve the results it gets. If you want a different result, we need to really change the way that the 
systems uh, work and not uh, tinker at the edges um, and, and not as I'm afraid some architects in our, in our country seem to think is, is that uh, a nice atrium and some cladding on the outside uh, will sort your problem. Hi, what's your wildest dreams for the future of healthcare? So uh, the future of hospitals, I would say, is, I mean, we're focused now on eradicating COVID. And if you look in the United States right now, New York Times reported at the beginning of the COVID that half of all Americans had at least one chronic disease that would put them uh, in serious harm's way of COVID. 75% of the spending or thereabouts, healthcare spending is on chronic disease, obesity, loneliness, stress. Uh, related to to lifestyle, all the things I think as Nigel was was talking about are things that are causing the disparities that COVID has shown us. You know, don't have anything to do with healthcare. So, what should we be focused on? The interesting thing is, how can we eradicate hospitals as we presently know them? As we presently know them, that become a place that focus on the episodic things that happen but we need to focus on all the things that have come about in the last 60 to 80 years um, that have been designed into our communities, our systems, and the ways, the ways that we do things that has built our modern healthcare system. Why? I love that. Eradicate hospitals. All right, Bill. As we well, presently know them. As we well, presently them, yes. It, it, I, it, and I promised Ty and I had not talked about this, but that was exactly going to be my point too. I've been talking with some senior executives about uh, an idea called an unhospital, essentially deconstructing what, what the hospital enterprise is, because it largely it's built around a business opportunity, our collection of business opportunities, and the government is involved and their ability to uh, oversee things is woefully inadequate, which uh, creates all kinds of opportunity to make money. And once once those um, elements are locked in, the system is the system. When we And Paul, you and I have talked about whether or not it's actually a system or not. We can get into Deming's theory, et cetera. But it is what it is, and it's behaving how it's behaving. So I think um, undoing that is, is not going to be an easy thing without replacing it with something else um, that allows uh, people to become engaged and um, reap the benefits of economic opportunity, point number one. Point number two, I think that the hospital of the future is largely going to resemble more something like a data center than, than a, a hotel. And I say that because of all of the analytics that are going on within hospitals right now um, that try to predict disease outcomes, try to um, meet her uh, um, effectiveness and efficacies of care, um, those are only going to continue. And the, the need for physical places around many of those engagements are largely uh, irrelevant. Sure, you, you're going to need um, places for, uh, for the environment of care around a, uh, uh, an orthopedic procedure, which has a high risk for infection. Uh, sure, you will need a place to aggregate uh, um, highly specialized teams and equipment um, to sort through who knows what's going to walk through the door. Um, but absent that, there's a lot of other uh, extraneous things that are really kind of fair game to really upend. Well, that was a wonderful summa a summation, I think, for our entire panel. Um, thank you, Ty, Nigel, and Bill, for uh, remarkable insights, both to what we've learned and some of the core challenges that we face in society to unleash uh, an epidemic of wellness, right? By eradicating hospitals as we use them, by realigning our financial incentives, by bringing joy back into this remarkable profession, and by uh, appreciating the impact of the political setting on all these things, understanding the limits of what we can impact, and also realizing that we need to use other channels in order to really transform some of the governance processes. So I wanna thank you all for your great thoughts and insights and, uh, and look forward to continue this conversation further. Thank you again, everybody. Great, thank you. All the best.